just when I thought I was out. They pulled me back in. He's laughing his sick fucking ass off. He's a tight ass. He's a sadist. Okay, when I introduce you, I'm gonna say, this is a friend of mine. That means you're a connected guy. Now, if I said this, that this is a friend of ours, that would mean you were a made guy. I capish. Boys, we're back in business. Our true enemy has not yet shown his face. Brother, you are going down. Who are? Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Our true enemy has not yet shown his face. Hi everyone and welcome back to yet another episode of my Al Pacino review series, Season 2, Episode 4. Today's movie is the return of a legendary movie saga and character, uh, namely 1990's The Godfather... Part 3, yes, the return of Michael Corleone, Al Pacino back yet again as Michael Corleone, once again directed by uh, Francis Ford Coppola and with uh, also screenplay contributions by Mario Puzzo, who co-wrote it with uh, Coppola, of course. And returning from the previous movie as well, we have Diane Keaton and Talia Shire. Uh, unfortunately, no Robert Duvall who I have to say is sadly missed in this film and he's been very vocal about why he's been why he was absent in the Godfather part 3 something happened there behind the scenes uh, not off to a good start there because yeah yeah like I said his presence is sorely missed anyway we do have new cast members like Andy Garcia, Sofia Coppola, Eli Wallach, uh, Joe Mantegna, Man Man I can never pronounce his name um, Mantegna, I guess I'm gonna pronounce it like that. I, I don't, I, I doubt if it's right, but but also George Hamilton and uh, Bridget Fonda, among others, are some of the new cast members uh, to this movie. This third Godfather film is sort of considered by many fans uh, as sort of the black sheep of the of the of the trilogy, and many are of the opinion that it shouldn't have been made and it was totally unnecessary. So, do I share? Uh, these views and opinions and is the Godfather part free the abomination that many people make it out to be and then uh, is it an abomination not worthy of the Godfather title well that is what we are going to be taking a look at today so without any further ado here's my review for the Godfather part free from 1990 the plot for the Godfather part free goes as follows it is 1979 about 22 years since the events of the Godfather part 2 for Michael Corleone, still played by Al Pacino, the move to legitimacy is complete. The New York crime business has been handed over to Joey Zaza, played by Joan Mantegna, and all of the elements of the Corleone business empire are legal, non-criminal enterprises. Michael, approaching 60, is now thinking about his legacy. His charity, run by his daughter Mary, played by Sofia Coppola, has just handed over $100 million to the Catholic Church. Michael also intends buying a large stake in International Immobiliari, a Vatican-run property company. Things are peaceful and stable, but then Vincent Mancini, played by Andy Garcia, Sonny Corleone's illegitimate son, starts a feud with Joey Zaza. This has far-reaching, deadly consequences, including for Michael's deal with the Vatican. Recycling many themes from the previous two Godfather films like loyalty, family, power, etc., this film primarily presents itself as a more tragic, reflective piece, a seeking of redemption for Michael Corleone. However, in this life, there are no redemption stories. Your past always catches up to you, as is exactly the case with Michael in this film. Finally, having his ties to illegitimate businesses cut isn't enough. People from his former life, like new character Don Altabello, played by Eli Wallach, just refuse to leave him alone and want a piece of the action. Michael's immobiliary deal, just the same. And when Michael explains he cannot be sharing in any of this legitimate transaction, a plot, of course, is formed to take him out. You just don't say no to mobsters. Let's talk acting. Al Pacino often received criticism for his third portrayal of Michael Corleone in this movie. However, I honestly never had an issue with it personally. Sure, his voice has changed and naturally he's aged since the second film, just as the character has. But I don't think it's fair criticism to say he's acting differently than he did in Godfather 2. People change over time, their outlook on life changes, their motivation changes, their behavior and demeanor impacted by choices and moments of the past. 
This is exactly why Michael feels different in the third installment. He's a conflicted man looking for some form of redemption for mistakes made in the past. And I feel there is power in watching Michael's final desperate climb for salvation. Pacino was haunting as a man who was outsmarted, outlasted and bested every obstacle that had come his way, only to emerge at the other end wounded and frail. The confession scene, for example, where Pacino as Michael confesses his sins is beautifully acted and performed and is one of the best scenes, not just in this movie, but one of the best scenes in the trilogy. Let's put it this way, Pacino's definitely not the reason why this movie isn't as good as the other two. Talia Shire, I feel, gives one of her greatest performances of her career here. It's absolutely incredible watching this character evolve from the first Godfather movie to this one. Here, she's fully taken her place as Michael's most trusted and loyal confidant, and asserts a position of power rarely seen by a woman in a quote-unquote mob movie. Another highlight scene is right after the aforementioned confession scene between Pacino and Shire. They're both truly excellent in that scene, wonderful stuff. Diane Keaton also has a great role in this film as Michael's former lost lover, who in her maturity tries to look beyond their past to find some common ground and reconciliation with Michael. And wouldn't you know it, right after a powerful scene where both do just that, her and we, the audience, are immediately slapped in the face again and reminded that there is no escape from this life and it always, always comes back around. Another highlight of the movie for sure. All of the new characters for the most part I really enjoyed seeing. Eli Wallach is absolutely brilliant as old man Don Altabello. Sure he's a bit of a Hyman Roth 2.0 but I think Wallach is just such a great actor that he just pulls you in and manages to stand out every scene he's in. Andy Garcia I think is terrific as Vincent Mancini and truly reminds one of James Caan's performance in the original. It's very easy to believe that this is Sonny Corleone's son. I feel like he's definitely the best of the new characters and does a very good job. For about 95% anyway, let me explain. As we get to arguably one of the biggest points of criticism this film receives, Sofia Coppola. Now, I honestly don't feel she does nearly as bad of a job as everyone seems to give her credit for. Firstly, she was never meant to take on the role of Michael's daughter in the first place. Originally, Winona Ryder was cast and literally dropped out at the very, very last second. Francis Coppola, desperate not to lose production time, made the split-second decision to cast his daughter, which she had absolutely no desire to do, but ultimately did, purely out of love to her father. Now again, a reluctant actress who actually never had a desire to act, being thrown into a man of production, the whole world took an interest to in seeing. Honestly, I'm amazed that we even got the performance out of her that we have now. Just imagine the pressure. Everyone and their mother was going to go out to watch this film after the first two. Honestly, it's a very daunting task she had to fulfill and I think it's commendable she did as good as she did. However, a flawless performance, of course, it is not. And the biggest issue I have with this film is in some part due to her and the writing, the incestuous relationship between her and the Vincent character. First of all, the whole relationship shouldn't have been written in the first place. This is just wrong and fails the story on every level. And second of all, Coppola and Garcia have zero chemistry in this film. It's a stupid subplot that has no business being in a Godfather movie and completely falls flat to boot. Easily the worst part of the movie is this quote unquote romance. Let's wrap up. While not a perfect ending to a legendary saga, it is at least a ending and a definitive one at that. Unless you watch Coppola's re-edited Coda cut, which honestly, if people say The Godfather 3 was a cash grab to begin with, I point them towards that useless and pointless recut. It adds nothing and doesn't even live up to the title The Death of Michael Corleone. Totally unnecessary for my money. Flawed and contradictory to itself in places, but still worthy of the Godfather title in my opinion, The Godfather Part 3 is not nearly as bad as people make out, and does close out the trilogy on a good note for me. Compared to most modern movies, definitely still a masterpiece, just not on the same level as the previous two films. Not a 10 out of a 10, but a solid 8 star out of 10 rating is what I give this. So there you guys have it, that was my review for The Godfather Part 3 from 1990. Um, yeah, like I said, I mean, it's definitely the weakest of the trilogy, it's definitely uh, slightly of a, a, an unnecessary sequel, but as I stated in the review, it's still, you know, the return of this character, the re you know, another look, another chapter of the Corleone uh, family. Is it a chapter that we could have, you know, we could have easily have done, gone by without seeing? Yeah, we don't really need to see the end of Michael Corleone's story in this way, like a definitive end. Um, you know, the way they, they sort of ended it in Godfather Part 2 would have been, you know, just, you know, fine enough. Um, however, yeah, like I said, the film gets eight star, 
eight stars out of 10 for me. Uh, the previous two Godfathers were, you know, 10 out of a 10, uh, you know, full blown out masterpieces. Um, this one definitely is, is the lesser one. However, I, I, I will never see myself giving this like a five or a four or whatever, or a six. Uh, like I, I think it sits well in eight. I mean, it's still a very well-made film. Um, you know, with the filmmaking and everything, the story, yeah, it suffers. I didn't, I didn't like the whole Vatican uh, angle. Uh, it didn't really appeal to me for for a mob story. Uh, Pacino, though, I mean, again, yeah, pe pe people do criticize Pacino because obviously he's he's way different in this than he was in the previous two films. Obviously, his voice has changed uh, dramatically since you know Godfather Part Two. Yeah, other than the voice change. Uh, he does act a bit different in the film as opposed to the other two, but you know, Michael Corleone, the character has changed. Godfather 2 ended at the, at the late 50s. We're now in the 70s. We're almost 20 years later. And, uh, you know, people change over time and, uh, you know, his, his views and, you know, his worldviews and stuff have changed over the years. So I, I don't really think it's that, you know, dramatic of a departure, honestly. I, th I think, honestly, the worst uh, part about Pacino in this film for me is probably his haircut. I just, I don't know what the hell they were thinking by giving him that weird, you know, haircut. It just has the, the weird spiky uh, gray hair. But, you know, like I said, I, I still like the film. I still like the film. Not as much as Godfather 1 and 2, that's for sure. I mean, Godfather 1 and 2 are like Desert Island movies. I could probably do without Godfather 3, to be honest. If I go to a desert island, I could only bring like uh, a handful of movies. Uh, I, w I would skip Godfather 3. But like I said, I, 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 I still think it's a good finale to the series. It's a good finale um, to the uh, Michael Corleone story. Is it a perfect finale? No. Um, does Coppola's recut, the, uh, the Coda cut, does it fix the issues? No. Is the Coda cut unnecessary? Yes. Uh, you know, like I said in the review, I mean, uh, just this, the slight sort of tweaks that he made. Uh, you know, going into it, I was expecting, you know, Coppola would have done with the Godfather part three a little bit like Stallone did with Rocky IV, like add new scenes and stuff and different takes and stuff. There was only like one or two things I was like, hey, that's a bit new. You know, he, he took out about 10 minutes of the film, I guess. Totally unnecessary cash grab, if you ask me. Uh, if people say The Godfather Part 3 in 1990 was a cash grab to begin with, this Coda cut, th no, that's a cash grab. Don't care for the Coda cut. I'm going to go with the theatrical any day. Anyway, enough rambling. Uh, Godfather Part 3. Take it or leave it for some people, uh, even for me. Uh, even though I still give it 8 stars out of 10, I still think, yeah, especially compared to films today, this one... This one is miles ahead. The, 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 this is still a good film in terms of filmmaking and acting. Even Sofia Coppola, like I said, honestly, I didn't think uh, she was that terrible as, as people say. Um, but yeah, that, I guess that's one of the beautiful things about, you know, being a movie fan. You know, each views uh, by people are, you know, subjective and are their own. Everybody has their own views. So, you know, it's, uh, it's all good in that uh, regard. Um, if you hate uh, Sofia Coppola, if you think she's absolutely terrible, fine. That's your opinion. I I I have seen more. I've seen more terrible acting uh, than than her performance. Let's put it that way. Anyway, that's it for today. Next week we are going to be <laughs> taking a look at um, a film from nineteen ninety one, which is a uh, again a little bit of a departure. For Pacino, we now covered pretty much two films where he played a mobster. You know, Dick Tracy, obviously the more comical uh, depiction of a mobster. And now, uh, of course, Godfather 3. Next week, we are going to be taking a look at uh, Pacino in a romantic uh, uh, role, in a romantic, as a romantic character. And, uh, and he's going to woo one of his old flames from... Uh, from a couple of years ago in, in terms of the movies uh, in the year, years of the movies in 1983 he was romancing Michelle Pfeiffer and uh, we all know how that turned out in Scarface and now he's going to romance Michelle Pfeiffer again next week in Frankie and Johnny <laughs> so tune in for that one if you can uh, I'm looking forward to that one I mean slight spoilers ahead Frankie and Johnny has always been a huge 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 favorite of mine uh, sort of 
uh, guilty pleasure, you know, uh, as a lot of you guys will know, I'm not the biggest fan of romantic comedies and stuff, but that's a movie I'm like, I'm going to save my thoughts for that one. Anyway, that's it for today. Keep punching, keep talking movies, and we will see each other very, very soon in the next one. Hooah! Take care.